A blast erupted from inside a Huawei lab in China. It's part of the telecom giant's research center relating to smartphone and 5G equipment. China's farmland has been hit by a series of natural disasters, but authorities still say a bumper crop is certain. Farmers have their doubts. Chinese media reports touting the success of China's vaccine trial, but upon closer inspection, Chinese media misquoted the WHO official. A Chinese textbook rewrites a Bible story. It claims Jesus killed a woman and said he, too, is a sinner. This comes as China and the Vatican are expected to extend a deal. And Russia, China and the U.S. swap accusations over the global pandemic response. That during the U.N. Security Council meeting. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, we turn to an explosion in China's southern Guangdong province. The blast reportedly erupted from inside a Huawei lab on Friday. Located in Dongguan City, the building served as a research center for the telecoms giant. According to Chinese media, about 1.5 billion U.S. dollars had been invested into the center. It was intended to fund mobile phone development research. The area hit by the explosion included labs conducting materials research and part of a manufacturing complex for precision components. It's responsible for outputting 120 million mobile phones per year. According to a Reuters report, the lab also conducts testing for 4G and 5G antennas. An insider from the research center told us that the area is also home to the facility's core confidential area and is not accessible to most staff. According to the local fire department, the building that caught fire was constructed with a steel structure. Firefighters explain that the fire mainly destroyed sound absorption material. No casualties have been reported, although we cannot independently verify the figure. After the explosion, the city's propaganda department at first denied that the blast had come from the lab. Instead, it claimed the building had been under construction and not in use. But videos posted on Chinese social media showed crowds of people fleeing the building after the blast, some of them wearing lab coats. Chinese state-run media later admitted that the explosion did come from the lab. The cause of the incident remains unclear. Huawei was not immediately available for comment. Unusual weather and climate patterns have been plaguing China nationwide, causing particular damage to the country's agriculture. Heavy rainfall has caused massive flooding, while disasters like mudslides led to destruction in other areas. But China's agriculture minister says this autumn's crop will be unusually productive. The statement has left farmers with more questions than answers. According to a new report in Chinese state-run media, China's agriculture minister Han Changfu said that China's autumn grain harvest this year is a foregone conclusion. He said the annual grain production is expected to increase. But Chinese farmers told us that crops have suffered heavy losses due to flooding. On top of that, farmland has been hit by locusts and bad weather such as hailstorms and typhoons. The weather, the floods in the plains, the drought in the mountains, the price of most of the grain has gone up. People have been storing food. It's impossible to believe the minister's words. Nowadays, the people are not fools. Another farmer, Mr. Tan from Hunan province, said that rice farming has declined because it's not profitable. He said the price of grain has gone up by 25 percent in his area compared to last year, which indicates the grain harvest was not good. The more important reason is that rice farming is not profitable, and so many people don't grow it. You have to believe the opposite meaning of the officials' words. They repeatedly emphasize the bumper grain harvest this year, which has never happened before. So I think it is very likely there will be problems with the grain harvest this year. Reporting by Xiongbin and Chen Jie, NTD News. Natural disasters aren't the only thing threatening China's grain supply. Two suspects were recently sentenced to over 10 years in prison. That's for their involvement in a grain theft case. 24 others were charged with being accessories to the crime and also face punishment.
The theft was first discovered last August. That's when a southern branch of the country's grain reserves group found over 400 tons of grain had gone missing. The missing seasonal reserves told hold a loss of nearly 150,000 U.S. dollars. The case exposed some major management loopholes in the corporation. Now, some are questioning whether there are moles in the operation. According to Chinese media outlet Inspection Daily, the grain thieves were able to get more money in exchange for less grain that they sold to the granary. They did it with the help of a remote control device hidden in the granary's grain scale. Technicians found the foreign device on the scale circuit board. It can remotely change the scale's weight reading at will. Warehouse surveillance videos also show that last July, two men snuck inside the facility after midnight. There, they covered the security cameras and remained inside the building for around half an hour. Later, the thieves invited farmers to sell grains to the facility, tempting them by saying they could add extra weight to the grain before selling it. Extra weight means more money for less grain. Surveillance videos also showed three men were often present when certain farmers came to sell grain. They could be seen using something inside their pockets, which was later verified to be the remote control used to adjust the digital scale. Within six days, the thieves added weight to over 80 truckloads of grain, around five tons each. Chinese media reports say the corporation has since ruled out the possibility of a mole. But netizens question the statement, some asserting that tech crimes depend on insiders. One comment reads, there's a leader behind those arrested who hasn't been arrested yet. How else would a few amateurs know about the surveillance inside the granary? Chinese authorities have changed the ending of a Bible story. The adjustment claims Jesus is a sinner and even that he killed a woman. This as China is about to renew a deal with the Vatican. NTD's Juliet Song has more on that. China and the Vatican are reportedly about to renew a historic deal. That's as a Chinese textbook has been found to paint Jesus as a murderer. In the original Bible story, a woman was about to be stoned for committing adultery, but Jesus stepped in, pardoning her sin and letting her go. But the Chinese textbook describes a different ending. It says when the crowd receded, Jesus stoned the woman to death, saying, I too am a sinner, but if the law could only be executed by men without blemish, the law would be dead. The textbook is used by vocational school students. It teaches professional ethics and law and has been approved by a review committee under China's education ministry. The discovery comes as the Chinese regime and the Vatican are reportedly about to extend a deal. It was signed two years ago and allows both Beijing and the Pope to appoint bishops in China. China is home to about 12 million Catholics. They're split into two groups, state-run and underground. Pastors in the country's state-run associations are appointed by the communist regime. State-run associations reject the Pope's authority, while underground Catholics recognize it and are often persecuted for it. But under the deal, the Pope has final say about the appointment of bishops in China and is recognized as the leader of the church. After it was signed, the Pope also recognized seven clergies previously ordained by the communist regime. Some conservative critics consider the approval a sellout to the communist regime. The deal is about to expire next month, and U.S. is calling the Vatican to abandon it. In an editorial, Pompeo wrote that human rights conditions for religious believers have deteriorated amid the deal. He cited an example of a Chinese Catholic who was beaten and taken into custody for refusing to join the state-run church. On Twitter, Pompeo also wrote, The Vatican endangers its moral authority should it renew the deal. He's expected to visit the Pope at the end of this month. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News. The U.S., China and Russia exchanged strong words at Thursday's U.N. Security Council meeting. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. criticized the Chinese Communist Party for the cover-up that she said transformed a local epidemic into a global pandemic. The world's scientists still do not have a complete understanding of the origins, characteristics and spread of the virus, an understanding that only the Chinese Communist Party can provide. UN Ambassador Kelly Kraft took aim at China and the World Health Organization at the UN Security Council meeting, saying the WHO assisted the Chinese regime in lying to the world. 
The WHO parroted China's narrative that the virus was not contagious at the beginning of the outbreak, even despite warnings from Taiwan in late December that it may not be the case. The WHO also opposed bans on travel to China. There is no reason for measures that unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade. The Chinese ambassador responded with angry replies, accusing the U.S. of mishandling its own control of the virus. I must say, enough is enough. You have created enough troubles for the world already. The U.S. is now standing against the international community and completely isolated. It's time to wake up. If someone should be held accountable, it should be a few U.S. politicians themselves. The Russian foreign minister accused the U.S. of unfairly attacking the U.N. and praised the WHO for acting professionally and in a timely manner. South Africa criticized the U.S. for its sanctions on Iran. Niger called for reforms on climate change, and Tunisia and Indonesia warned of political rivalries in the international institution. The U.S. ambassador criticized the members for focusing on what she called political grudges rather than the pandemic. You know, shame on each of you. I am astonished and I'm disgusted by the content of today's discussion. I'm actually really quite ashamed of this council. Members of the council who took this opportunity to focus on political grudges rather than the critical issue at hand, my goodness, President Trump has made it very clear. We will do whatever is right, even if it's unpopular, because let me tell you what, this is not a popularity contest. She said President Trump made the decision for the United States to withdraw from the WHO due to its lack of transparency and accountability. The U.S. was the WHO's largest funder. Kraft said the U.S. will shift its resources to other, more credible partners. The West is calling out China for its suppression of Hong Kongers and the Uyghur ethnic group. The comments came during the United Nations Human Rights Council on Friday. China is facing a rare rebuke. At the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, representatives from the European Union, Britain, Australia and Canada called on China to restore basic legal rights in Hong Kong. They also demanded the regime open up to scrutiny over its Xinjiang region, home to the country's Uyghur Muslim ethnic group. In the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The national security law is being implemented with the apparent intention to eliminate dissent. It allows prosecution of certain cases in mainland China, a jurisdiction where defendants are often held for long periods without charge or access to legal counsel, and where we have concerns about judicial independence, due process, and reports of torture. No state should be above the law. China's turn has come. At the council, a Uyghur Muslim testified that his family is being held in a Chinese concentration camp. He urged the council to name a UN investigator for his native region. Chinese representative Jiang Duan rejected the allegations, calling the West's human rights policies hypocritical. UN human rights chief Michelle Bachelet said last week she was discussing a possible visit to Xinjiang with Chinese authorities. FBI Director Christopher Wray warned on Thursday that Chinese hackers are still targeting U.S. companies, specifically their research relating to the CCP virus, including areas like testing, treatments and vaccines. Ray testified to the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee about threats to the U.S. He said almost within days after a U.S. company or research institution denounced progress, cyber attacks tied to China would follow. He described it as very aggressive activity, adding that China is the nation's greatest counterintelligence threat. Now we take a look at some Chinese reports about vaccines. Earlier this week, a number of Chinese media outlets reported that the chief scientist at the World Health Organization said some of China's COVID-19 vaccine candidates proved to be successful in clinical trials. CGTN, the English version of the Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece CCTV, also published a news piece about it. But clicking on the CGTN article shows it has been deleted. On closer inspection, the translation was inaccurate. The WHO chief scientist actually said if some of China's vaccine candidates proved to be successful. 
but it was reported by Chinese media missing out the word if. Five Republican senators are urging Netflix to reconsider plans to adapt a Chinese science fiction book trilogy into a TV series. They say the author has defended the Chinese regime's treatment of Uyghur Muslims. Five Republican U.S. senators have urged Netflix to drop plans for a TV adaptation of a Chinese science fiction series. Lawmakers led by Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee take issue with the author of The Three-Body Problem, Liu Suxing, and his defense of China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims. Netflix announced earlier this month it would be turning the book and its two sequels into an English-language live-action TV series led by the creators of smash hit Game of Thrones. Liu is set to serve as a consulting producer. The senators pointed to Liu's comments in a 2019 interview in The New Yorker. He was asked about China's clampdown on Muslims in the Xinjiang region, where a United Nations report has estimated that around one million people, mostly ethnic Uyghurs, were detained in camps and subjected to ideological education. Liu was quoted as saying, Would you rather that they be hacking away at bodies at train stations and schools and terrorist attacks? If anything, the government is helping their economy and trying to lift them out of poverty. The United States and human rights groups have criticized China's treatment of Uyghurs. But China's foreign ministry has repeatedly denied the existence of internment camps in Xinjiang, calling the facilities vocational and educational institutions, and accusing what it calls anti-China forces of smearing its Xinjiang policy. In their letter to Netflix, the senator said Netflix's decision to adapt the three-body problem amounted to, quote, normalization of the Chinese government's crimes, and asked Netflix to seriously reconsider the implications of providing a platform to Mr. Liu in producing this project. Netflix had no immediate comment. A TikTok challenge has led to an FDA investigation. On Thursday, the federal agency announced it is looking into reports of teens participating in the so-called Benadryl challenge. The over-the-counter medication is used to treat allergies. Teenagers in the challenge are encouraged to take large doses of the drug. According to the FDA, teens have reportedly ended up in emergency rooms with serious injuries and some may have died. The FDA warns that taking too much Benadryl can lead to severe health problems, even death. It says it contacted TikTok and is urging the app to remove videos of the challenge from its platform. India is preparing for another skirmish at its border with China. New drills part of the ongoing military standoff between the neighbors. The drills took place at an airbase in the Himalayan border region close to China and Pakistan. It is suspected that both China and Pakistan may come together against India. The Indian Air Force said it was ready for undertaking operations simultaneously on both fronts. The Indian Air Force is fully trained and ready to undertake operations by day or night on both the fronts. The air warriors are fully trained and highly motivated and we stand by the motto of Indian Air Force to touch the sky with glory. Another pilot was asked about their capability to undertake night operations in these tough terrains. He said their warfare capabilities have increased a lot. He is confident they can undertake all types of missions from the forward base, even at night. The Indian Air Force is often performing drills at the Himalayan border. Twenty Indian soldiers were killed there during violent clashes with Chinese troops in June. The recent arrest of an NYPD officer acting as an illegal agent for the Chinese Communist Party has been garnering attention. His ties to the Chinese consulate raise concerns about how the Chinese regime spreads its influence overseas through what's called the United Front Work Department. We sat down with the Epoch Times China editor Annie Wu to learn more. Hello, Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you back on the show. I'm glad to be here again. So recently, an NYPD officer has been charged with acting as a spy for the Chinese regime. So what kind of agencies would employ such a person? Yes, so the court documents show that the NYPD officer had handlers in the Chinese consulate in New York City. And according to prosecutors, his handler, one of them, is in charge of a united front group called the China Association for Preservation and Development of Tibetan Culture. Now, um, on the surface, this name sounds great. It sounds like it's a um, wonderful organization. But um, this is actually one of the united front groups operated by Beijing to essentially uh, promote 
the agenda of the party. So you mentioned the United Front work. So what is that? Yes, United Front is a very broad term, and it actually encompasses many different government departments within the Communist Party. But essentially, all of them seek to influence both people inside China and overseas to adopt what Beijing considers important for its goals and essentially uh, stamp out any form of dissent against it. So uh, in the West, that often uh, includes business associations, uh, so-called friendship associations or cultural groups. So the United Front work basically tries to stamp out any dissent, as you mentioned, against Beijing. But what other places could you see that in action? Uh, yes, this is actually very common on uh, university campuses. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has uh, highlighted the issue of Confucius Institutes and Chinese student associations on campus that are uh, pretty much influenced by the Chinese consulates to uh, monitor students and make sure they toe the party line and uh, don't voice any dissent against the Chinese regime. And uh, there's also allegations that uh, these uh, Confucius Institutes and student organizations try to spy on uh, students in order to uh, make sure that they toe the line or uh, potentially that they try to uh, assist Beijing in uh, their uh, espionage or uh, tech theft uh, efforts as well. So you mentioned Secretary of State Mike Pompeo stressing about the Confucius Institutes on American universities which could be under the United Front work. So what are some ways we could protect ourselves against this kind of influence? Well, yes, I think awareness uh, about what these groups are and what they do is probably one of the uh, most important things. Uh, actually, Pompeo also highlighted this week in a speech uh, the kind of potential threats of these organizations. He said that the State Department was probing into two specific United Front groups that operate in the United States. So uh, we'll see what will happen after the State Department invest investigates them. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Annie. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, Tiffany. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.